Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Fabulous Fridays. Hi there, Kim. How are you doing this morning? Good. How are you? Hey, we're doing great in Bozeman, Montana. It is a fabulous Friday because we have sunshine and it was zero this morning, not 21 below. Yay. So that's the weather <laughs> report for everybody. <laughs> Okay. Okay. What are we going to be talking about today? Well, we've got something very interesting, and that is maybe some answers to the question, should I gift while I'm alive, or should I wait until I've passed on and leave an inheritance, or what the fancy word is, is bequest. That's what we'll be talking about. My name is Marcia Getting, and I'm one of the co-hosts for the program this morning. And I'm a family economic specialist with MSU Extension. And what that means is I work with really wonderful people like Kim and other folks, our county extension agents across the state, because what this is, is taking Montana State University to the people. And so it's really great to have you join us this morning. Our other host is Kim. Kim Sutra Woodring, and she's the county extension agent up there in Shelby, way up north, which I would think it's colder there than here. Is that right, Kim, or not? Um, I was just going to check, actually. It says it's 23 right now, so it's... Oh, well, Banana okay. Belt, USA. You won't even need to wear your coat today. You know, yeah. us in Montana are strong. The other person that uh, sometimes goes unappreciated is our webinar assistant, but not unappreciated by me. She is the one that's developed the website that you utilize. She's the ones that sends you out this reminder about the meeting today. And she's the one that kind of keeps me on track about what I'm supposed to be doing. So I appreciate Carrie very much. And today we're excited to have with us one of our board of directors of the Montana 4-H Foundation, all the way from Sydney, Sydney, Dylan, excuse me. And she's going to be joining us later in the program to share it with us her 4-H story and her experience with being on the Montana 4-H Foundation board. Now we've had 144 people across Montana register for this particular webinar series. So we're delighted about that. And we're also delighted that we have 15 out of staters. Now, how you found out about it, who knows? Maybe you have some relatives in Montana that said, hey, you should look at this and uh, attend and see what you can learn. Now, Kim, I think uh, we usually have engagement tools. So tell us what we're going to be using today. Yes, so the pine drop flower is to remind us that we can uh, use the chat to ask questions in the chat panel and we can stop the webinar and answer your questions if you have them. Yeah, and Carrie's going to help us keep track of those. And oh, I forgot to mention, Kim, we've never told folks that the chat room is private. In other words, the only people that are going to see it are Kim and I and Carrie. So that way, you don't have to worry about your sister-in-law in Libby maybe seeing what it is that you said. We want to assure that you have that big word that starts with an A, anonymity. Yeah. Okay, Kim. Yes. Um, we also want you to know that we will remain in the WebEx room for about 15 minutes after the webinar to answer any questions that you have. And this is a really good opportunity to get to chat with us. So our first audience engagement tool is what actions did you take as a result of last Friday's session? You can click more than one in the poll panel. Did you A, add PODs to your financial accounts? B, add TODs to your stock, bonds, and mutual funds? Did you read the transfer on death deeds mock guide, the TODs? Did you print out the beneficiary designation form for a vehicle or vessel? Did you tell your friends or relatives about pods, tods, and tods, beneficiary or beneficiary de designation for vehicles, or did you F other? Um, please explain what you did in the chat room. And again, you can click more than one of those options. And I'm glad T uh, Kim told you to hit the submit button. I don't know how many times I've forgotten to do that. So yeah, don't forget to sure see that yours is counted. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got um, some folks that have responded. And so what we're going to do is look and see what our results are. And can you see those, Kim, or is the print too tiny? Yeah, I can see them. Um, what happened? It looks, looks like a lot of folks told their friends and relatives, so that's good. Getting more people to know about this stuff is really helpful. Um, the next most popular one was they read the transfer on death deed mock guide. That's really good. good. Um, and then we had a few people that printed out the beneficiary. Okay, great. There's a comment in the chat that said um, someone tried to find out if they should change the pods on their accounts to Todd's. Okay. Okay, well, I'll throw in something about that because yeah. the Todd's are for your stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. And your pods are for your financial accounts as in savings, checking, and certificates of deposit. And don't forget, some of you added beneficiary designations on your stocks and bonds years ago. And if so, those are still fine. You can change them if you want to. So you don't have to change your beneficiary designation on your stocks, bonds, and mutual funds to a Todd because you already have it. Okay. Well, let's see what else we've got to do today. All right. Um, so if you've joined us in the past, you may know that we use wildflower names as reminders or key points about our webinar today. Um, they're just fun little reminders for us and hopefully they are entertaining for you guys. So this is the steer's head flower. Um, we boo, boo. <laughs> Sorry, what? I couldn't resist. I, I thought it was at a live meeting and I'd show this flower and I would uh, wait and see if anybody could guess the name and most people couldn't. So I give them a hint and I go, moo. Well, that didn't help. But sorry about that, Kim. I thought you were booing me. No, no, it's moo, not boo. Funny. Um, so this reminds us that our first objective is that we hope to steer you to consider whether to give a gift while living or leave an inheritance slash bequest after death. Our second objective is to steer you to an enlightenment about death taxes. So Marsha, will you start off by telling us personal reasons why a couple would consider leaving an inheritance or bequest? Okay, well, I'm going to use the pink Cory Dallas to indicate some reasons. And that's because I know Corey and Dallas. And Corey and Dallas have just been having an informal conversation about what they should be doing. You know, uh, if we, why wouldn't we give it now? And so the reasons they came up with, well, Corey, you know, she's really concerned about not having enough left for long-term care expenses because in their family, uh, parents have wound up in a nursing home. They know how expensive that is. And uh, the other one is basic living expenses. You know, that can be a problem as well. So we talked about long-term care. And then Corey's a little concerned about spoiling the children or the grandchildren. You know, she doesn't want to have any of those trust brats. Uh, they're just afraid that they'd be spoiled if they got so much now. And Dallas grew up in the depression and he's really afraid that the children will sort of just waste this hard earned money that they have earned throughout life. So they would like to take advantage of it while they're still living. And then Corey says, yeah, and I wanna make sure we have enough that we could make sure that some passes on to her favorite uh, nonprofit and Lo and behold, of course, it's the Montana 4-H Foundation. Now, I think those are some reasons that Corey and Dallas have shared of why they would wait until later and leave a bequest. But what about you? Have you given some thought to why you're not gifting now? What reason? And we're going to give you just a little bit of time here to type that up in the, in the chat room. Uh, why are you waiting? And again, nobody's going to see this, but Kim and I and Carrie. So we'll give you a couple of minutes to do that.
And while they're doing that, uh, did you get any snow up your way, Kim? Um, it tried to snow a little bit yesterday, but it's been pretty nice the last few days. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got some on the ground from what we had before. And yeah. I look at it and think, okay, more wildflowers. The more moisture we have, that means there will be a great wildflower. Yes. This summer. My husband wants to go ice fishing tomorrow. So I'm kind of hoping that there's still ice to fish on. Uh-huh. Are you a ice fisher person too? Mm, I don't really like the cold. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I can ski, but uh, sitting out there just freezing to death doesn't sound good. Yeah. Okay, Carrie, do we have... <laughs> yeah, sorry there, Kim. That's okay. Carrie, uh, do we have any uh, body that's responded in the chat room? Yeah, we have numerous people. Do you want me to read all of them? No, just pick out some of the really great ones and we'll save some of the others uh, for later. How would that be? Okay, one says fear of running out of money prior to passing. Mm hmm. Um, we can another, all identify with that and, one. Yeah, and another one says we are just entering into retirement and want to have all or most of our retirement savings working for us to fund our retirement. Good. Kids and grandkids don't know how to manage their budget. Right. Have, um, like Corey, I have concerns about having enough for life. And concerned with the living expenses and the cost of inflation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not something we kind of worried about for several years because the inflation rate was so low. But, hey, I've been around a few years and I can remember when it was 18 percent, believe it or not. Of course, our certificates of deposit were earning that much at the early time. So thank you, Carrie, for sharing those. And thanks to all of you for responding to just give us an idea of uh, some of those concerns. Now, uh, Kim, how about giving some reasons why Corey and Dallas would decide to go ahead and give gifting while they're alive? All right. So some of the reasons that Corey and Dallas want to give a gift while they're alive. Um, Corey says to express love and affection for their um, giftees. They may not be their family directly. It could be their friends, but they want to express how much they appreciate them. Um, Dallas would like to give an opportunity for his children to participate in the management of their family business. Yeah, that kind of sounds like a farm ranch uh, situation there, or it could be downtown too, right? Yes. Um, so Corey would also like to help finance a college education for their grandchildren and their children. And Dallas would like to help pay medical costs for their children or grandchildren. Corey would also like to watch their children and grandchildren enjoy the benefit of the gift while they're alive. And finally, they would like to avoid the death taxes. Oh, I hear that term all the time. Those awful death taxes. We're going to show you some stuff. Yes. So, I, okay, here's your opportunity to, again, uh, express reasons why you would gift. And I think I saw a couple of those flash up that they are gifting now. And it doesn't mean that you're giving that gift every year, uh, but you are helping out or just gifting. So why are you gifting while you are alive? And we'll give you a little bit of time to respond to that as well. Somebody in the chat asked why I'm living in Shelby if I don't like the cold. <laughs> and good thing. That's a good question. <laughs> I know, that's the people from Kansas. I moved here a long time ago. And they knew how cold I was all the time. And they said, you could, they couldn't believe I would move to Montana. But I tell you what, what you can do is buy a lot of long handle underwear. I got tops, I got bottoms, and my wardrobe certainly changed from that of Kansas. Although anybody that's lived in Kansas know about the Kansas winds. Yeah, I just okay. need to leave my house, really, so I don't need any new clothes. <laughs> Okay, Carrie, do we have a couple of people that have responded? 
Yes. Um, someone said we gift our grandkids mutual funds as much as possible. Oh, good. Hoping for a growth there. Very good. Um, to help a child with a down payment on a home. I've heard that many times. Yes. To help kids and grandchildren reach some of their goals, like buying a house. Mm -hmm. And to be able to experience the gift appreciated. Uh huh. And um, urgent needs at this time versus later in the children's lifetime. Exactly. Yeah. Very good. Okay, well, those are all wonderful reasons, uh, and thank you for sharing that. And I'll just put it a bit in, too, those of you that are uh, recognizing some of your charities, uh, they would like to recognize you while you're still alive. And there's a real movement, I think, to say, let us say thank you while you're alive instead of when you're gone and can't really do anything except for your memory and your friends and your family, of course, would realize that. So we've done a good job of taking a look at those things. Yes, okay, we did that. That was my cue. I got ahead of myself. So much okay. more reminders. So Marsha, what about death taxes? We mentioned that um, when Montanans leave property after they die. Okay, well, I'm going to use Richardson Geranium to explain this concept. And I uh, would like to introduce to you, if you haven't met her, is Granny Richardson. And Granny Richardson is like a lot of the couples that I talked to in January. And they were the young ag couples. And it was very interesting because they're concerned about the inheritance tax. And you see, an inheritance tax is based on the value of the amount that you inherit. Okay, so we have those across the United States. And even in Montana, there was a stranger in the blood. I just want to break out and sing Frank Sinatra's stranger in the night. <clears throat> okay, moving along. So we've got that. Well, of course, Granny Richardson passes away. And you wouldn't believe it, but Granny has a Ferrari. Now, I had to ask him, how do you pronounce this word? But it's a Ferrari, and it's worth $1.4 million. Cough, cough, cough. So she's using the new Montana MV13 form to leave that to her grandson, Mark, who happens to live in Bozeman. And I'd like to know what percentage rate will Granny's grandson have to pay on that inheritance of 1.4 million, which is the fair market value of that Ferrari. So you can check 40%, 28%, 12.9, 6.9, or zero. So we're gonna give you a little bit of time to let us know what rate you think that Mark will have to pay. Okay, Clary, <laughs> Carrie has closed the poll and we've got some results here. And we see, uh, oh, 33% of you said zero. We had 8% say 40%, 5% that said 28, and another 5 that said 12.9. Well, the persons that got it right are those that said zero. Yes there is no longer an inheritance tax in the state of Montana, uh, and it's been since 2001. But these young couples at the Young Ag Conference in January that I was telling you about, 80% of them thought we had an inheritance tax in the state of Montana. So we don't have to worry about that death tax. So fabulous granny is just saying, um, we don't have to worry about it because and if somebody comes to your house, knocks on the door and says, hey, you need to establish a trust so you don't have to pay any inheritance taxes. Bull, as they would say in Eastern Montana. No way, because you don't have an inheritance tax. Now, the second tax that Granny has been concerned about is the federal estate tax. 
And oh my goodness, there were times when people were driving their tractors uh, at our capital. And yes, there were times when we had really high uh, federal estate taxes. And basically what the federal estate tax is, is on the value of everything you own. So it's, it's like you put everything in a pile. And then what you do is we establish the fair market value of that. So that's one of the responsibilities of the personal representative is to hire the appropriate people to put a fair market value on your home, on your land, anything like that that has value. So, well, let's go back to Granny. Uh, Granny is going to leave this $1.4 million car. I just can't imagine. Anyway, to her grandson. And then we find out that Granny has a ranch in eastern Montana. And the value of that is $10 million. Woohoo! So the total of Granny's estate there is pretty high, isn't it? We've got uh, how much? See, I have a photograph over the, ah, one, $11.4 million. That's what Granny's estate is when she dies. So now, of course, I'm going to ask you, what percentage rate is Granny Richardson going to have to pay on the combination of the Ferrari and the $10 million ranch? In other words, she's got $11.4 million. So in the poll, you can check 40%, 28%, 19.9%, or zero. Marcia, we received a question. Okay. Are state inheritance taxes based on the state, Montana, et cetera, of the deceased or the decedent? Okay, what it is, is when we, um, when we, I'll say when we had an inheritance tax, you know, the rate for the spouse was like 2%. So it was based on what that spouse received. And then that one that I was using was a stranger in the blood. And that would be an example that I had of, uh, it was a, an elderly man and he had no children, but he had a lot of respect for the, this kid down the road. But the kid down the road was not a relative. So the man was going to leave his ranch to this kid down the road. And the value of that was extremely high. And the kid had to pay 37% rate on that. Now, it doesn't mean that the kid would necessarily have to dig up that amount. But they would try to take it out of the estate and pay the inheritance tax. That's what the personal representative would do. But sometimes people would put in their will, the inheritance tax will be paid by the receiver. So that's the way that works. And we've got a federal estate tax, which is different. You see, the inheritance tax is based on the value that goes out to the individual and the relationship. So that's what other states have. Polling here shows us we're looking at the results and we've got 45% that said zero. We had 10% that said 40. And again, we've got our two five percenters that went with the 19.9 and the zero. So let's take a look here and we'll find, ta-da, the answer is zero. And the answer is zero because this year, 2022, you as a single individual can have $12.06 million and not pay a federal estate tax. So here's Granny. You know, she's thinking about the old days instead of the present days. And she only has $11.4 million. So there is no estate tax on that. And I'm showing you this table just to show you how the dollar amounts have changed. Way back in 2001, it was 675000 So there were a lot more people that ended up paying the federal estate tax. But the amount is going up. Now, supposedly, well, not supposedly, as of now, in the year 2025, this is all going to revert back to the year that we had only 5,000, or 5,000, 
five million. We'll see what happens with that. So that's the federal, what we call the federal estate tax exclusion. So married couples, you can have up to twenty-four million one hundred and twenty thousand before you pay the federal estate tax. So I think the federal estate tax issue is not the issue that it was years ago. As a matter of fact, only 0.02 Montanans end up paying the federal estate tax. So, uh, Kim, why don't you tell us about the tax situation when people are making gifts out there? Okay. All right. So we are going to use the golden prickly pear for this example. Um, we have the federal gift tax. This is a living tax on the dollar amount that a person gives to another person. And these are the federal gift tax golden rules. The Department of Treasury establishes the rules about giving while living. The IRS definition of gifts in publication 509 is that the transfer of property by one individual to another while receiving nothing or less than full value in return. So this is an example that the IRS has a sale at less than fair market value. You, for example, you sell 500 acres of land valued at $1 million to your son for $1 per acre. So that equals $500. You have made a gift of $999,500. In this other example, using joint tenancy, you place a home valued at $350,000 in joint tenancy with right of survivorship to your daughter. So then you have made a gift of half the value at $175,000. So for our fourth poll question, uh, what is the dollar amount that you can give annually during 2022 and have the amount exempt from the federal gift tax? Is it A, 6,000, B, 10,000, C, 12,000, D, 15,000, or E, 16,000? Make sure to click your answer and hit submit. Okay, Kim, when are you going to start hinting for a gift <laughs> that I can give without paying a gift tax? Mm -hmm. Okay, it looks like people answered this one really quickly, so they must know the answer. Yeah, wow. Unless, oops, wrong place. Okay. Well, it looks like we've, we're kind of all over the board on this one. Um, the majority said E, 16,000. Then next, uh, with 12%, they said 12,000. 10% um, said 15,000. Well, the folks that said 16,000 were correct. That, so that was E. The answer is 16,000. And you can give this gift to as many people as you wish tax-free, as long as it's 16,000 or less. And they don't even have to be relatives. Hello, my name is Marsha. <laughs> Marsha, you got a question here. Okay. If Granny gifted the two million before she died, um, the estate would have exceeded the twelve point oh six. So would that be added to the estate regardless? Okay, if we'll just hold that question, we're gonna bring these two together and, and I'll answer at the end. So keep going, Kim. All right, so again on that, if you are married, if you have a spouse, they may join in the gift amount, and that would be $32,000 as a gift that you can give to a pair of spouses. An exception in the rule is that you can provide unlimited amount of money for medical costs for another individual as long as you write a check to the provider. Another exception is that you can provide unlimited amount of money for tuition if you pay that directly to an educational institution. So if somebody wants to pay for grad school, that'd be great. 
Oh, Kim, I'd love to help you out. But, you know, I worked for the state, too, so I don't have that spare money. But yeah, I, I wanted you to mention this because I run across a lot of people that would, you know, grandmas. And they say, oh, I would give to my grandson, but he would just lose it all in taxes. You know, they're thinking that $16,000 would go on top of what their really smart computer nerd is earning. And so you say, oh, they just lose it all. No. So if I decide to give Kim $16,000, help her out with grad school, there's, um, you know, she doesn't have to declare it as income at all. Yes. So, Marsha, tell us about the story of when one of your participates, participants wanted to test a gift. Well, this is a lady that I had wanting to visit with me after one of my programs in out in Montana. And she was concerned about the kids, just like some of you were saying, they don't seem to know how to budget. They don't know what they need to know. And so we talked about it. And obviously, she is someone that had um, plenty of money. So I said, well, one of the things you could do is test a gift. You know, you could give like $16,000 to each of your adult grandchildren and just sit back and see what it is that they do with it. So that's what she did. And this is one of the daughters and I, uh, I or granddaughters, I'm sorry. She had been to one of my meetings previously. And one of the things that we talked about was medical care savings accounts for the state of Montana. So she put 4,000 in hers. She put 4,000 in her husband's. She put some money in an IRA in the first time home buyer account because Montana allows you to put aside $3,000. So this granddaughter wrote grandma and said, grandma, I've just, I am so thankful for what you gave to us. I wanted to share with you what we spent the money on, spent notice. And so she gave her this example. And then the very last paragraph said, and not only that grandma, because of the way that I used the money, my husband and I were able to save another $2,285 in income tax. And 1,035 of that was Montana because you get to subtract the MSA from your income. You get to subtract the first time home buyer from your income. See, this is not really using granny's money. It's using your money, but you're using it in a way that you get to subtract from your income. Really cool. So she says, granny, we saved this money. Now, what do you think that granny is going to do for this granddaughter next year. Not only that, what do you think granny is going to do to the two children, grandchildren, who never even acknowledged the gift? Can you believe it? Receive that much money and not write a thank you note? Ah, I couldn't believe it. Ah, okay, so. Gifts do allow parents and grandparents to express their generosity while they're alive, and you get to see how the recipients use the money. So we talked to state taxes, we uh, talked about gifting, and you see, it, when you think of that 12.6 million, it's not 12.6 for federal estate taxes, and it's not 12.6 for gifting. They are unified. So we had a law that unified those two. And it says, if you're going to do all this gifting, we're going to subtract that from that 12.6. So the person that asked the question is very astute because yes, granny would have owed some gift taxes on that um, if she'd gifted it to him. But since she didn't and left it, she had the full 11.4 because the value was stepped up to that 11.4 and that's what the kid received. Okay, so I've got some questions for you. What uh, are you going to do? Are you going to gift while you're alive, wait until I die, or are you going to do a combination of those? And I think I already know kind of based on your responses to our questions.
Okay, Carrie, what have we got for responses here? Okay, it looks like what we've got are, we're going to see a little bit of combination of the two. And if you're in a financial situation to do that, you know, that is a really super idea for sure. Now, this is my white albino. Uh, I had to work it into my program. And this is what it looks like usually, you know, a very nice purplish kind of flower. But uh, what we're going to do right now is look at this um, difference in basis. Okay, now basis is the amount of the investment that you have in real and personal property for tax purposes. And what we want to do is look at it for gifting while you're alive versus bequests. So we've kind of left the topic of estate taxes and gift taxes, and now we've got another one to look at. And what we're doing is looking at Grandpa Albino, who has a ranch that he paid 50000 for. Okay, so we're just going to make it simple and say that's his basis. And he's interested in succession planning. So what he's doing is he's going to minimize death taxes. See, he's worried about those. So he gifts the land to his son in 2022. And it turns out the value of the gift is $6 million. So does Grandpa Albino have to pay a federal gift tax on this gift of the $6 million? Okay, Carrie brought up the poll. That means you can answer this very quickly, yes or no. And of course, Kim, this is the question that allows us to see how good of teachers we are. Mm -hmm. And don't forget good, to hit submit. <laughs> yeah, don't forget to hit submit because we want to make sure that you all counted. Okay, Carrie's given us the results and I'm going to drum roll. Oh, uh, <laughs> I wanted to see 100% on that answer of no. Okay. Why? Why doesn't, Kim, why does a Grandpa Albino pay a federal estate or a federal gift tax? So Grandpa Albino doesn't have to pay a federal gift tax because his gift was valued at less than $12.06 million. And we had talked about that a little bit earlier, but that's okay. We'll give you guys another chance. Yeah. Um, so again, this gift goes up for married couples and spouses. You can gift for a value up to $24,120,000 and not pay a federal gift tax. Yeah, just can't imagine that, but more power to them. Yeah, that's a lot of money. I'd like that gift. <laughs> yeah. So our next question what is the grandson albino's basis in the gifted property? A, $50,000 that grandpa paid for the land. B, $6 million fair market value date of gift. C, $5,950,000. The difference between the amount paid and the fair market value at date of the gift. And as Kim says, don't forget to hit the submit button. Yes. You know, grandson albino is not very bad looking. Maybe we could set up a date or something if I wasn't married. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, Kim, you're married. You can't. <laughs> oh, darn. <laughs> okay. So let's see what the responses of the people are. Okay. So we've... Tell us, Kim. Okay, so... Um, 36% said $6 million and 12 people, so 29% said $5,950,000. Oh, I'm so glad that we asked this question because you know what, Kim? Only 2% got it right. <laughs> wow. Um, so the basis of gifts for the albino grandson is that the donee, which is the albino grandson, assumes the donor's basis in the property. And the donor's basis was the $50,000. So that is your answer. And this would be true, too, for those of you that have stocks and bonds and mutual funds. And that's why you hear financial planners saying if you're going to gift uh, gift the low basis stuff because it'll go to your kids and they're in a lower tax bracket. Okay. 
Now, what's this called? Um, so this, um, the carryover the, basis. Oh, the carryover basis. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the donee, which is the grandson, will have a basis of fifty thousand dollars. So in twenty twenty two. If the albino grandson sells his ranch for $6 million, we will have a capital gains calculation of $6 million sale price minus the $50,000 basis, and his capital gain will be $5,950,000 that he will have to pay. Right, Marcia? That's right. And boy, would I like to have a talk with this young man. You know, yeah, here grandpa <laughs> leaves you something like this and you're selling it. But it's because he's selling it that we run into this problem. If he kept it, not a problem at that point. So, uh, Kim, what I did was calculate up the uh, taxes. Take a look at that. Mm -hmm. So the total tax that he owes for the federal income tax as a result of capital gain upon the sale of land is one million six hundred and six hundred thousand five hundred and fifty dollars maybe i don't want to go on a date with him yeah he's stupid <laughs> he should have kept not, the land i won't say that he's not financially astute <laughs> so marcia what are the taxes if grandpa albino waits until he dies to bequest his ranch to his grandson. Okay, well, we're looking at the inheritance then. And we go back to the same thing. Uh, Grandpa paid $50,000 for the land in 71, and that's his basis, so we know that. And we know he still wants to avoid those doggone death taxes, okay? So Grandpa now is going to leave the property to his grandson after he dies. So he passed away, and now we've got that same fair market value of $6 million. So we want to know now, what is the albino grandson's basis in that property? Okay, so Carrie brought up the poll, and you guys are smart. You know what it is. You're going to click on it really quickly. Oh, I can see, I can hear those minds churning. Okay, Carrie, I'm going to rush you on this one because I want to make sure we have time for our guest. Okay, so we've got 12% that said uh, 50,000. We had 38% that said 6 million. And we had some that thought it was 5,950,000, the difference between the two. Okay, the people that got that one right are the 38% that said 6 million. You see, what we do is it's stepped up. So the value is stepped up from grandpa's value to the value, I'm sorry, the, the value that he had of 50,000 is stepped up to the 6 million in 2022. So in this case, if the grandson is stupid enough to sell, okay, what's the capital gain amount, Kim? Ta-da! Zero! You see, he inherited at six million. He sells it at six million. There is no estate tax. Or I'm sorry, capital gain, capital gain. That's what we're talking about. So then uh, we compare the two. You know, if we're looking at that, the gifted asset, and we the son selling, that's the key. If the grandson did not sell it, we don't have to worry about this capital gain business. So that's something to think about as you are doing some estate planning, thinking about, okay, I'm going to leave it to this person, and gee, uh, they get a stepped-up basis. But if I gift it, it's a carryover, and if they're going to sell it, it's going to be costly to that individual. So let's say by 2051, oh my, uh, he didn't sell it. And what happened is it increased in value, and the grandson dies. Well, the value then is stepped up to the value at the date of death of the grandson. 
So what we have right now are generational step up in basis. And I was trying to get a Mont guide done on this topic because there was a lot of discussion about this in December and November. And I was really worried, ooh, what's going to happen with that? I was a little late getting it out, but it's there. It's one of the Mont guides that are that is in our fabulous Fridays. And that will explain this in more detail for those of you that are going, huh? And believe you me, when I started reading and studying on this, I didn't quite get it either. So it takes a little bit of time to uh, to do this. So I was going to have you do this, but I see we're running out of time. Uh, so I'm going to take over and say, you know, from a tax saving viewpoint, the grandson is better off from a tax angle of leaving the land as an inheritance instead of a gift. But that's when we're looking at taxes. There may be very good personal reasons why grandpa wants to go ahead and give the gift to the grandson. So let's, let's not just be economists when we're making a decision, but also think about what is good for the grandson, because you may want to reward him for the kind of work that he's doing. So that's what our Albany, oh, and Kim, we're just, we're running out of time. So if you don't have a member like the elephant's head, uh, don't forget about those 50 Mont guides that we have available. And don't forget, they're also available in county extension offices like Kim's. She's there. She can run them off for you and what have you. So now what we'd like to introduce to you is Shelby Martinell, who is from Dillon, Montana. She is on the Montana uh, 4-H Foundation Board of Directors. So Shelby, I hope you are here. I'm going to quit, uh, stop sharing the screen so that everybody has a chance to see you. So everybody, if you turn on your cameras, or Shelby in particular, And don't forget, those of you that uh, are hanging out because you have some additional questions you want to ask, we're going to get to those right after Shelby. Hi there. Glad to see you. And I see Kim. So everybody say hello to Shelby. And Shelby is in Dillon, as I mentioned. So uh, I'll start out by she uh, Shelby to ask you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, would you please? Yeah, so I was born and raised in Dell, Montana. Um, grew up on a, I'm the sixth, sixth generation on a family place. So um, ranching's in our blood. And um, I've been involved in 4-H from a young age. My parents liked me to have a lot to do. Uh, keep you out of trouble that way? Yeah, absolutely. They, uh, my parents both did 4-H when they were kids, and so I think they found a lot of value in those programs. Uh-huh. What was your favorite 4-H project, and why? Definitely horses. I was a crazy horse girl, maybe still am. <laughs> so we always had horses growing up, and that um, I learned a lot in 4-H and gained a lot of connections, and so still value those lessons today. Uh-huh. Uh, were you one of the 4-H'ers that got to go to 4-H Congress? I would imagine. I did not ever go to 4-H Congress, no. I went to uh, Rec Lab. I went to uh, state horse shows. Um, a lot of the horse events were at the same time as other things like Congress. So uh -huh. that was part of why. <laughs> yeah, well, I hear Rec Lab is coming up. What was, what was it like when you took or went to the Rec Lab? You know, as a kid, I did not savvy the level of organization that it takes to gather like hundreds, a hundred, 60 to a hundred kids and keep them organized and doing things. <laughs> so I remember it as, yeah, I remember it as just being um, really fun, like to see my friends across the state that I may not have seen at other times. Um, now, I'm like, wow, there's a lot of moving parts to Rec Lab. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, and I hadn't heard of it either. And I have uh, had previous guests on talk about the Rec Lab and everything that's involved with it and the ambassadors. Uh, and we yeah. even have an ambassador on our 4-H Foundation and provide some great insight into and sharing of what goes on. 
And Shelby, I hear that you were kind of a project leader by default. What was it on the horse project? How did that happen? Yep, horses again. So um, when I moved back, so I worked in Oregon for a while. And when I moved back to Dillon, um, there, one of the project leaders that had led when I was a kid approached me about leading the 4-H horse in Beaverhead County because she was like, listen, I've done this for a long time. <laughs> Uh -huh. It's time for someone else to do some things. So I did that for a while and kind of until I joined foundation and then that took up more of my time. But um, they have they have a great program here now and a lot of involved parents. And so it's been really cool to see that develop. Mm -hmm. Did you have clover buds when you were in 4-H? Is that they did, did. a long time? Yeah. They have, yeah. Clover buds. Um, Clover Buds is really a good, the good foundation for like getting kids together and showing them about projects and kind of the little things you can do and little records, you know, little things. And then by the time you get into old enough to go to your club, you already have a really good foundation for all the things that you're going to need to know and do. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, tell me, how did you wind up on the 4-H Foundation Board of Directors? Yeah, so um, I work for Northwest Farm Credit and we always like to have somebody on the board because um, Farm Credit's highly involved with 4-H, um, not just in Montana, but all across our states. And so when a position opened up on the board, I was, I was like, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to be involved at a little bit of a higher level than just county. So that's been really, really fun and kind of has reconnected me to some of the same people now that I'm an adult that I knew when I was a kid. So that's been kind of funny too, as you go around and I'm like, well, I didn't know you were an extension agent now, or I didn't know you were involved in the board or just, it's a small world. Yeah, and particularly in Montana, you know, it, it seems like, yeah, we say that several times that uh, when you run into folks. Uh, you mentioned about the horse project. Um, you know, when I was in 4-H, it was cooking and so on. And I always wanted a horse, never had a horse, had money that I was saving in a little container thinking someday I'd get a horse. So have you had just one horse or several horses? Oh, no. So um, I don't know if you guys know this, but horse hoarding is genetic. And so my family has always had horses. Um, they, when I was a kid, my grandpa was raised in Bronx um, for with Hogan Rodeo Company in Idaho. And so they had horses like in the NFR and um, my grandpa ran all the mares and then they would just take the horses and buck them. And then the horses that didn't buck hard enough got sent back to us. So that's what I grew up on. And then oh. um, eventually we got into better riding horses. And so now I have um, a bunch of brood mares and then four or five um, horses that I ride and sell all the time. And so it's ongoing. That's why I got to work at Farm Credit to support my horse habit. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> uh, you said that Farm Credit does uh, really support the 4-H program. Could you maybe give some examples of some of the things that they've done in the past? Yeah. So one of the, one of the major things, so not only 4-H, but we're really involved with the land grant universities as well. So last year they gave um, money to all extra money. I think totaling like a million dollars in each state to the land grant universities in all of our states. So that'd be Idaho, um, Oregon, Montana, and um, Washington. And then we also do business in Alaska. Um, so then this year we gave, I think it was 10,000 additional, and we usually give around five to 10 to the foundation. Um, just, we had a really good year, interest rates were low, People were lending, and so we like we're a cooperative, and so we like to give back to our communities, and so that's one of the things they really like to support. Not only with um, money, but then like my time is if I'm during work time, it's they it's volunteer, and then they give us volunteer days and encourage us to reach out to Extension and 4-H and uh -huh. Foundation and anything that. Um, I mean, your volunteer days are yours to use, but a lot of our employees came from ag or went to MSU or are involved with extension. So we spend a lot of time with um, extension and 4-H and foundations and 
clubs and project leaders and all those good things. Oh, well, are you familiar with the people partners grants that the foundation? You know what? I am not. That is one thing that I have kind of missed. So I don't okay. know a ton about them. Well, I only know because I ended up uh, uh, evaluating some of those submissions last year. And I know the person that made the endowment was here when I first arrived. Her name was uh, Jerry Finn, and she was with the Forage program. And one of the things she firmly believed in was putting some money out there where you could get a group of foragers, just like, you know, forage idea of them getting together and making a decision on what could we do for the community. And one of the ones that I remember was a, a group that was going to plant plants at the nursing home. And I thought, oh, that's really great. Uh, but I took it kind of one step further and I said, you know, one of the things you need to do is after you plant that, you need a little sign there that says this is courtesy of the 4-H Foundation or the People Partners Grants or something along those lines. And so I think sometimes a lot of good goes on out there with 4-H. Uh, but the, you don't necessarily know it was a group of those kids uh, that were doing it. And so it's really, really fun to see them grow up. And like you're saying, and I look out there and I think, you know, I guess it's being nostalgic. But I look and I think those are our future leaders. Those are the individuals that are going to be our legislators. Those are, who knows, we might have a president from Montana someday. Right. So I think the 4-H right. program is, I'm biased, I realize that, but it does <laughs> a lot of good, and uh, it's people like you that are willing to take the time out to be a part of the 4-H Foundation, and it's your employer, you know, go farm credit there, that they're willing to support all the programs that we have. So, um, Shelby, we just thank you for joining us today. It's been great. Uh, next week, we're going to have another guest. Uh, on our show. I call it a show. Sounds better than a <laughs> webinar. You know, join the show. Yeah. And uh, again, thanks so much for joining us, sharing with us. And I look forward to seeing you at the next board meeting. Okay. Yeah. Thanks okay. for having me. Uh -huh. Bye bye. So now we want to give those of you that have questions an opportunity to ask those. And so, Carrie, would you take a look in the um, chat box or panel? and see if there's any questions there for us. Yes, Marcia. Um, is a federal gift tax the same as a federal estate tax? Let's look at them as the same. You don't, again, don't have two. You have a unified. So you can give gifts that are taxable up to the 12.6, but if you do that, you have nothing left as an exemption when you die. So if you're working with an attorney or accountant, what they're going to encourage you to do is, if you're doing both, let's keep them under the amount because you only have one exemption. You don't have two. It's unified. And we used to talk about the unified credit, and I did that way back when. And people just don't relate to a credit. What they relate to is what is the total amount I can have and not have a federal estate tax. So there's still plenty of techniques that can be used out there for individuals that are on a, or in a federal estate tax bracket. So if you're a married couple and you have more than that 24,112, uh, then yeah, it's time to visit with the attorney, visit with the accountant and see if there are ways of minimizing that. And gifting at $16,000 a year doesn't have to be reported. So that's why sometimes people have LLCs, S-Corps, C-Corps, and they're gifting shares under the 16,000 so that they don't have to pay the gift tax, but they're lowering the value of their estate at the same time. Okay, Carrie, another question? This question might not pertain to today's webinar. Do you want me to? Yeah, ask go it? ahead, okay. let's see what it is. It looks like the MV12 form can only be used if the descendant's entire estate does not exceed 50,000. 
For many who own a home, savings, et cetera, this form cannot be used. Is that correct? No, the beneficiary designation form can be used. There is another form that says if the estate is left less than 50000 So that's the one we don't want to use anymore. And people were using it anyway. I mean, to be quite honest, we're just going to transfer this to that. So there's an old form that's out there that says, yeah, you can't use this unless you have 50,000 or less. But the new MV13 form can be used regardless of the size of your estate. So you can go to the Department of uh, Motor Vehicles and just Google or make a search, I'm sorry, for that MV13 and take a look at that. But it's a good point to bring up because I have an old Mont guide that's still out there and it still applies to that old form. And so I'm going to have to decide, am I going to delete that one or just keep this new MV13? But we're going to have a lot of people that could still take advantage. But true, $50,000, that's the amount that the legislature has used for over 30 years, to be quite frank. And, you know, we needed to bump that up. Okay, Carrie, any others? Yes. Since you don't have to report gifts of up to and including 16000 in 2022 to the IRS, is it correct that giving those smaller amounts annually will not take away from the $12.06 million? Exactly. You okay. got it. Exactly. Because those are what we call a, a gift that you can make annually and not pay a gift tax, nor use up some of your exemption. So those of you that are able to do that, and you don't have to give the 16,000, you know, you can give five or you can give 10. It doesn't have to be up to that amount. You decide what it is that you can afford to do. Okay, next question. Have filed a TODD to avoid probate, but last week heard of a title company holding off one year to clear title. So should I revoke the TODD and leave to will designation? Oh, that is a good legal question, and I wish I could answer that. But as an educator, I can't give you advice because I, I don't have the law degree. But I can say, look at what your objectives are. And what do you think that the person will want to do? If they're going to want to sell it immediately, then our TOD, it, you know, the consequence is the TOD isn't the way to go. Whereas you write a will and you're going to leave that, then yes, the will has to go through probate, but then the creditors have um, four months and to submit their bills and you could sell it quicker. So it's what is the recipient going to do with what they're inheriting as far as the real property goes. And that would then give you the guidance. And I could say, also visit with your attorney. You know, I'm hoping that with the next legislative session that the better group, the business estates, tax, trust, and real property section is going to jump on that issue and come up with some sort of solution because nobody anticipated that the title companies would not be willing to issue insurance on a house that has a Todd or land that has a Todd with two Ds. Okay, next question, Marcia. If you gift more than 16K to one person in one year, do you have to submit the form separately from the one, the 1040 tax forms? Right. There is a federal gift tax return that you would need to file. And it doesn't mean that you have to pay a gift tax, but I've got some people that are submitting those when they're giving interests in land because they want to establish that the value of this land is X. And then the IRS has three years to come down and say, no, that, that was a low ball or that was a lower than it should be. So that is something, if you've got a good accountant, and, and I encourage you, 
sometimes what we've got are folks out there that are making decisions based on past law or past experiences that they saw happen with their parents. And they think that's the way to go. And I think in this day and age, before you decide that you're gonna put somebody else's name on your property, it's a good idea to check with the attorney. Yeah, they're gonna charge you a little bit, but they may save you making a mistake that would cost you thousands of dollars, or if not you, your heirs, thousands of dollars in whatever went wrong with it. So be very careful before you start putting anybody else's name on your real property and understand the consequences because the attorney will tell you about the step up in basis, about the carryover basis, and then you make an informed decision. And certainly we as extension have a obligation and that's why the mont guys are there to save you some of that attorney time because then you're informed when you go in and you ask different questions and the attorneys can tell me marcia we can tell when people come in that have read your mont guides they have totally different questions and i'm honest why should you pay somebody 200 dollars an hour when you can read our mont guides and save the money and then ask more pertinent questions of the attorney or the accountants. Marcia, this is the last question. Our current will is over 20 years old and needs to have changes on it. Do I have to go through a lawyer in order to change it? If not, how do I legally make a new will? Okay, you've got some, some choices there. Sure, you can uh, go to the attorney that wrote it and say, I want to update this. And probably 20 years ago, maybe he doesn't even have that computer file anymore. Uh, and that attorney could update it, or you could go to a, another attorney. And we've got a mock guide that has information on selecting an attorney to help you develop a state plan or handle a probate. And we give you clues and we're going to have a session on that uh, on March 18th, as a matter of fact, on how to select an attorney to help you with estate planning. So, you know, and, and I know people want to do it themselves. I appreciate that. At the same time, you want to make sure you've got it right. And, you know, and there are, there are will forms out there. But when I heard that there was one being offered, I took it around to my office to all these PhD people. And I said, hey, do you know what this writer representation means on this will? Nobody did. But yet people were signing that will form, not realizing what was going on with it. So up front, you ask the attorney, hey, I'm, I, need, I have a will. I want it to be updated. Here's some ideas about some changes I have, and I would expect the attorney to have some ideas too. But give me, Mr. Attorney or Ms. Attorney, an idea of the cost. You know, are we talking a $200 will, $600 will, $800, whatever it is? It depends on the time that it takes. So the attorney is going to send you out, I suspect, some forms. Well, we've got that Mont guy that says, what my attorney needs to know. So you'll have that already ready. We've already saved you some money by having you know the things that the attorney is going to want to know. And sometimes he or she is going to want to actually see the documents. People don't know necessarily the difference between joint tenancy and tenancy in common. And it makes a big difference sometimes in how you title that property for the future. So, yep, there is a holographic will and you could write it in your own handwriting, but will you know? And the other thing, it could be the will that you've got is fine, except for a couple of paragraphs. So what the attorney would do then is say, let's do a codicil. Okay. At the same time, I'd say, well, how much is a codicil going to cost me? So that you've got a sense before you go in about what the cost is. Okay, Carrie, you said that was the last one. Are there any others that just came up while I was on my podium going, pounding, saying, be careful? No, there is not. That's the last question. Okay, well, great. 
Well, again, this has been a fabulous Friday, and I know, Kim, you can't see her right now, but the reason you can't is there's a noise in her office, so she keeps muting her phone. Uh, there you are. Hi, Kim. Well, you have any last words of wisdom that you want to offer to our participants today? Um, I think just making sure that you're on the same page with your family um, when you're planning you know, to do things like give the farm to your younger, you know, grandchildren or sons or whatever, sons or daughters. Um, yeah, just making sure you're on the same page, whether they plan to keep the ranch or farm in their name or if they plan to sell it down the line, that will depend on what kind of gift you want to give them or if you want to give them one at all. Okay. And I would encourage you to use this fabulous Fridays as a conversation topic with some of your relatives. I know it's difficult to go up to grandpa and say, hey, how's your estate plan going? Uh, you know, cause sometimes grandpa thinks this is a little forward for the youngest member of the generation. So say, hey, uh, I have been participating in this webinar series and one of the speakers said this, and is that been your experience, Grandpa? Or what would you recommend? Or, oh, Grandpa, they even have this mont guide that's about gifting and whatever. Uh, let Grandpa know, or Dad, or Mom, that you're not trying to be taking over everything, but you're trying to educate yourself. And it's like the 4-H program. Sometimes it's the younger generation that teaches the older generation. So be safe, keep healthy so that we can see you next week. And we're going to be looking at financial estate and health care documents that we need to put together in case of memory loss. And believe you me, that could apply to all of us. It's not just Alzheimer's, but we could be in an accident. We could fall down the stairs and bonk our head and have some memory loss there. So Carrie, again, thanks to you. Thanks to you, Kim. And we will see you all next Friday. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.